Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Thomas Klepak. I teach in the biology department. Um, turns out, for any of you that live on campus here, I'm also your, this is Ward 3 here in, in Waterville. I'm your city councilor. I'm your city council representative um, for the city of Waterville. Uh, I absolutely do not, but I also absolutely welcome any uh, civically minded volunteers that are uh, interested in participating in any fashion in the municipal life of their community. Have all kinds of ideas, lots of ways to put people to work. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, this picture here that I'm showing, these are the seals of the city of Waterville and Colby College. This is what they looked like back in 1896 which was the year that of the first major outbreak of brown tail moths. Uh, I'm showing that to highlight that this is actually not a new problem here in this uh, region, but uh, because of a variety of factors, primarily uh, climate change, this problem is uh, becoming exacerbated. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the biology of these critters, uh, some of the pathogenesis, um, like what they do to cause, uh, yeah, irritating health conditions. I'll go through a little bit of the history of the outbreak um, and then briefly talk about some of the causative and mitigating factors, uh, particularly focusing on the climate correlations. And then I'll put on my city councilor hat and talk about some management strategies uh, and policy recommendations that I formulated for the city of Waterville to, uh, that we implemented over the last fiscal year. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you a little bit of an update on how those worked and just a glimpse at some of the uh, things that uh, we're hoping to do in the future with uh, Amanda and her team. So uh, here it is in all its glory, uh, Euproctis chrysorea from Eurasia, New England. This is actually the female uh, with the characteristic brown tail. It is those uh, orange uh, tails or setae that you see on the back that actually are the uh, causative agent of the uh, pathogenesis of these. Um, this is, uh, and rather than using terminology like invasive uh, species, it's simply an ecologically unannealed xenobiotic species uh, with really no um, native biological controls. Um, it poses a real human health uh, nuisance. So here's the life cycle uh, here in New England. And first, I'm going to give you some of, some of the terminology. Uh, I assume there's no biology students here. Uh, a larvae, that just means uh, when it's a caterpillar. Um, and those are really, that's the stage that we're going to be focusing on. Um, then pupae, uh, this is when uh, it goes into a cocoon. Uh, the larvae goes into a cocoon. And then the imago, or adult moth, it will uh, emerge. Um, there is this. Uh, phase in the life cycle called diapause. This is when the larvae uh, go and form a, an overwintering nest. Um, and then gregarious in this uh, context simply means that they like to feed together uh, versus dispersive. Uh, this is when they feed uh, on their own. They, they disperse uh, with one another. Um, and in the, in the larval stage, they go through these different molts. Uh, this, these are iterations where it grows larger and larger and it sheds. Uh, so those are, each of those stages are called instar. Uh, and then the hairs, I used this term earlier, the setae. Um, so yeah, here's, here is the life cycle. Um, this is the part of the calendar, nine months of it, the vast majority of the calendar year. Uh, these critters spend their time actually as caterpillar. We call them the brown tail moth, uh, but that's actually only one month of the year, nine months of the year, they're in uh, some sort of a uh, caterpillar form. The big yellow block at the top of, of that calendar wheel uh, is diapause, and that's when they're nesting. They're not feeding. Uh, this is really uh, the time on the calendar that we, we want to focus on because it's the ideal time to identify infested trees after leaves have fallen, and then it's an excellent time to actually treat. It's not when, um, uh, it's not when it's, they're a peak problem. It's the best time to deal with it, though. Uh, of those, oh, yeah. So in the, in the paper that we read, yes. they talked about flying, about 
airplanes over coastal Maine and then like looking at defoliation. Yeah. Um, so you see the defoliation when the leaves are on the trees, but you see the nests when the leaves are not on the trees. You see the yeah, I mean, they, they fly over, they're, they're doing two passes. You know, there's, there's the, like, uh, the, the canopy survey where they're looking at defoliation. And I believe that happens uh, usually in the fall. Okay. Um, and then there is the winter web survey, and that's after leaves are off. Uh, and, and they, for that, they just go out into the field. They pick some spots along the highway and they stand there and they just look around and when they see um they just you know have these descriptors this is the main state forest service they have these descriptors for uh how infested that particular location is they don't do it tree by tree but it's by location yeah um so they only feed three months of the year so imagine that if you there were only three months of the year when you were eating any food um, and that is actually to our advantage uh, a little bit, but uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, the, prob the time when they are most problematic is this part of the calendar. This is when we have the most hair exposure. Uh, the, the caterpillars are at their largest at that point in time, uh, and they can do the most damage. They're shedding, they're going through these instar, shedding those hairs. Uh, this is when it really drives people crazy, and they start calling up City Hall. <clears throat> okay, so just a, a little bit of the biology, um, and we'll start with the egg mass. The moths will lay an egg mass uh, in the late summer, uh, mid to late summer. Uh, it's this, that tail becomes uh, the egg mass uh, that gets extruded by, uh, oviposited by uh, the, the female moth. They can have two to four hundred uh, eggs in them, and it's this, uh, that it's this felt-like covering. The reason this creature has a moth phase, like really the brown-tailed moth thinks of itself as a caterpillar, uh, but the reason it has a moth phase is so that the tree that it had been laid on as an egg, it grows up as a caterpillar, it strips that tree off, uh, it goes into pupation, turns into a moth, and then flies to another tree. Right? It can't really get off of that tree as a caterpillar. It's stuck on that tree for 11 months of the year. Right? So it becomes a moth so it can go to a new place to feed uh, for the year. All right? So you know, it prefers non-current year defoliated trees for laying, for laying eggs. I, that, that should make sense, right? Um, and this is what they look like. They're actually cute little things. You don't mess with them, don't play with them, but they're, they are cute. Um, here is uh, a, the, a later, uh, like a second or first or second instar. So you can see them uh, on the egg mass crawling around. Um, and they, they begin to eat uh, the leaves on the tree, but then uh, the weather starts to get cold and they go into these nests. Um, so you can see the early instar. This is when they're in the gregarious feeding phase. Uh, they all stick together as a thermal mass and will strip the trees. Uh, you can see them cleaning this off. Because they're so little, their jaws aren't big enough to like eat the whole leaf. They just eat the soft parts and leave the veins behind uh, with this sort of like lacy leaf uh, pattern. Um, in the spring, they just eat the whole leaf when they're bigger caterpillars. Um, okay, so they're polyphagous foliovores, meaning they'll eat anything that has leaves that fall off a tree. Uh, they're not, you know, like the emerald ash borer only likes ash trees, for example. They'll, they'll eat anything uh, that's not, that's deciduous, anything that has leaves that'll fall off of it. Um, these are their preferred uh, foods, though. Apple uh, and, and oak are their two preferred uh, foods. So then they, the weather gets cold. It's this time of year. They're getting a little bit bigger, and they form these web, uh, webby nests uh, in the trees. Uh, here are some examples of them. Um, and they start to aggregate like that to like as thermal mass at night. And uh, it takes them a while to build these webs. So they're feeding, building nests uh, for the winter. Uh, and this is what they look like, second or third instar. 
uh, of these things. The second instar would pro this was probably in the fall that this guy here uh, took this picture. The one on the right was probably in the early spring when they're first emerging uh, and they're getting a little bit bigger. Um, I'm going through some of this kind of fast. I I, I want to get to the other bits. Um, yeah, so uh, these nests can have anywhere from 25 to 400 uh, larvae per nest. There are there can be some like pretty large ones. If they if a tree was heavily infested, it can just like w wipe out the canopy of that of that tree. There can be a, a ton of them up there. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, there's been, you know, back in 1903, they, they even, uh, there's the study that was published that had over 800 in nests that they sampled. So they can be pretty big. Um, and then they emerge from these nests in the spring, and we get these late instar uh, in caterpillars. You see this thing, it is, looks cute, don't touch it. This will bring a, a bunch of misery to you. I'll show you some nasty pictures in a little bit. But they have this characteristic two uh, orange spots on the dorsum. Uh, you'll see that near the the the, uh, the distal end there. All right. So, and here's a lateral view. You can see these long hairs uh, are pretty nasty. I'm not going to show you a lot of pictures of. I have a bunch of stuff for a medical community. I give this talk to sometimes, but uh, those little needles are like hypoderm. The, the spines are like hypodermic needles. They are literally hollow tubes that have toxins in them that they get in you, they inject you with the toxin. It's really bad. Um, I'll talk about that a bit. Um, a couple. So they don't get eaten. <laughs> they don't care about us, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's so that other things leave them alone. Um, all right. So they'll strip a tree, and then uh, in early June, they go into pupation. And here, this you might look at this picture and you think, oh, it looks like the fall or like early spring. No, that's like early summer, early to midsummer. Look at the trees in the background, the lush foliage. They had stripped that tree. And then you can see up and down, let's see if my pointer works. You know, here are these pupation uh, cocoons all over the trunk of that tree. And they'll be all over the place, too. They can crawl down off of a tree. If there's something close by, uh, they can, they can uh, pupate there as well. Anyways, the moths come out uh, in July, August, and fly off somewhere they mate, uh, lay the egg cases, and the cycle continues. So um, during that phase, artificial lighting can be a real uh, problem, which is one of the reasons that Waterville and Colby's campus is uh, so affected like we're we're a big we have a light pollution problem in waterville uh, it's only getting worse uh, and colby definitely adds to that there's a big glow over campus um, and so colby is particularly uh, a rough spot because um, you know we have this big light pollution problem and then we have this like massive uh, reservoir of deciduous trees right here we're surrounded by trees in a big bright spot so Colby is definitely, during alumni weekend uh, early this last summer, I was sitting with a couple students under that tree over there in the new Bixler walkway or whatever that is. And um, the, both of the students had caterpillars that started crawling up them from the tree we were sitting under, which is like, it's absurd. Yeah, they were shocked that I, I, I stomped and smushed the caterpillars because, you know, I've done, I did yoga with them for years and I thought I was so like zenned out, but I was ready to kill these caterpillars. Um, yeah, so, you know, here's just an example of that. This is out in front of the AC. You can see that tree in the background there on the right where it had been stripped out. Uh, this is just a picture I took of uh, one laying an egg case on the artificial light itself uh, right in front of the AC. So this is definitely on campus. Uh, what happens if you get the uh, things on you? I'm not going to read all the bullet points here. Those are for doctors. But, um, you know, you get really nasty rashes. And I'll just show you some pictures. Uh, these papules that usually happen uh, in points of, you know, thinner skin uh, that are open to the environment uh, can be really bad. Some people can have really nasty reactions. Actually, there's an example, there's a case of a girl who had the enucleation or loss of an eye because she got them in her eye. Uh, someone in 1914 died from inhaling uh, the, the smoke from burning a stack of these things. Not trivial. They're not trivial 
critters. Uh, here's, let's see if the video, yeah, look at this poor kid. <laughs> yeah, this was a neighbor of mine, his, uh, her, her, her son put a, uh, his baseball jersey on and there were caterpillars in it and then he just got completely coated. The kid was doped up on Benadryl and steroids for a week after that in utter misery. So, yeah, not, not fun, not fun for anybody. Oh, I guess I do have a picture. Anyways, here you can see some SEMs. Uh, these are old pictures uh, from the 70s, uh, electron micrographs of them showing that they're barbed and they're hollow tubes. Um, don't want to get them in, in you. Uh, so historically, it started in Somerville, Massachusetts. They were on, you know, probably in the 1880s on some sort of ornamental rose. They uh, brought it to New England, blew up in 1897, uh, got all the way up to New Brunswick, and then um, actually it, it was uh, two things, some advantageous weather and, that eventually happened and killed them off, and the introduction of a parasitic uh, fly, which I'm not going to take the time to talk about today, unfortunately. But uh, the, the current outbreak uh, started in 2015. This is the data set that uh, Groden, Dr. Groden, uh, in the paper for today, uh, her data set goes back to 94, but the current outbreak started in 2015. Um, so when this first uh, was a problem that I came on my radar a year and a half ago, I went back to the, uh, through the city reports uh, for the city of Waterville, and I looked at their uh, municipal expenditures uh, the, to get a sense of how they treated it and what the scope of the problem was so I could put together a budget for this year. Back in 1914, they spent uh, $63,000 uh, in inflation-adjusted um, funds. That represented 75% uh, in March and then 98%, 99% of municipal expenditure in the month of April on this problem. Here they paid bounties, they paid by the pound for this stuff. Here's this woman with a huge pile of these things that she's trying to cash in. Uh, that is a tough lady right there, man. I can tell you, I would not want to stand next to a giant pile of those things like that. That's pretty impressive. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and they would send crews of these people out into the trees. You can see that the canopy of that tree is completely destroyed by uh, the moths, and then, you know, these people taking their life into their own hands up there for that cool picture. Um, it was a, a series of cold, wet springs that, and the introduction of a parasitic fly that ended it in 1922. So we actually, this past year, uh, we had the very uh, good fortune of a cold, wet spring uh, which has helped the, the current outbreak. It hasn't eliminated it. We need that for the next two, three years. But uh, you can see here what happens in the cold, wet spring. It, it causes the growth of an opportunistic uh, fungus, the, the Entomophagia lysiae, uh, that, that grows uh, on, the, on the surface of the, mall, or the caterpillars and, and kills them. Um, so I'm sure that Groden talks about that in the paper. Here is the uh, life cycle back in 1920. So I want to get to climate effects now. Uh, the life cycle back in 1920, uh, you'll, you'll see that, wow, there's this big diapausal uh, phase and everything got kind of uh, collapsed down. I have this picture of them treating it in Massachusetts. This was one of the reasons uh, that people did so much uh, lead arsenate spraying, which is why so many uh, dug wells in New England are, are contaminated with arsenic right now, um, this and the spongy moth. Uh, but um, yeah, this is what the life cycle is now, right? And so what's happening, you'll notice, is the amount of time that they're nesting is getting smaller. The amount of time that they can feed is getting longer. Maine is getting more hospitable to these creatures, all right? So that's a century. That's a century of, I, think, I don't think that data is in Groden's paper, um, but she's got the same story, right? That's the same story that's in the paper you had to read. And I'm gonna uh, show some stuff there. So, and it's getting worse, in fact. This is anecdotal data uh, from last year, and we can see that eclosion happened even earlier. Um, uh, the, the, Eclosion is the emergence of the adult moth. Uh, and so they were able to lay eggs 
and uh, have more time in the fall and late summer to feed. And Grodin's paper uh, talks about how that is uh, directly correlated with defoliation in, in the subsequent year, right? So uh, this is, you know, we're heading towards the kind of life cycle like in its native habitat. This is the life cycle in Valencia, Spain. Smaller diapause, longer uh, post-diapausal and pre-diapausal uh, time, time bands. You know, the pupation, imago, and egg, uh, form, egg incubation are kind of fixed by the biology, but it's, it's those different larval stages, it's the distribution of the larval stages, which is a predictor of the severity. So this is the paper uh, that uh, you all had to read. Um, yeah, so Eleanor found that the uh, increased average temperature in August and September uh, was correlated positively with subsequent defoliation, meaning that if it's a warmer fall, they have more time to eat before they go into uh, hibernation, and they have less time they have to spend in hibernation. And then also decreased average precipitation in May and June is positively correlated with uh, defoliation, meaning that if it's a dry or warmer spring, we don't have problems with the, the fungus, right? And so they're more robust caterpillars heading into the feeding season. So this is the one uh, diagram here, and I don't, I don't know, I don't want to steal uh, your thunder, but I, I walk through this. Uh, should I skip over this or? Um, I also have that in there, but you can. You just have to okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, in blue are the life cycle stages, and then uh, the, the green are accelerating factors, and red are the mitigating factors. So I'm going to just start at the eggs and walk around uh, this systems diagram here. Um, all right, so September, we have uh, pre-diapausal early stage larvae. They're, uh, they're eating. And the longer that they can spend uh, time in that phase, the more uh, fall defoliation you're going to see. So warmer autumn uh, increases density of the hibernacula, as you can see there. And then the maturity of the larvae that are going to emerge the next spring. The further along uh, the instar are in the spring, the more uh, robust they'll be, the more able to withstand uh, the rigors of, of the spring here in Maine, and then the more uh, defoliation that they'll be able to wreak on our forests. Um, all right, so increased uh, winter precipitation actually protects the larva, she found, in the hibernacula, uh, in the upper canopy, um, and allows them to survive. Uh, so that is like sort of a, an inverse correlation in terms of uh, precipitation, to, depending on where it falls in the calendar year. Uh, on the other hand, increased precipitation later in the season, in March and April, like this freezing sleet, sleety rain, um, it's, it's hard to live through that for them. They've emerged. It's uh, leading to decreased survival. There's less time that they can feed in, in their dispersive di post-diapausal larvae, and it delays pupation. So that's sort of like putting brakes on, on the outbreak. Um, Increases in temperature from March through September, so through the summer, are going to give us a earlier maturation in pupation, um, and it encourages these older caterpillars uh, to feed more and to strip the trees of their leaves more. And then uh, increased precipitation in May and June is going to uh, allow that fungus to kill them off, and that's definitely a mitigating factor that we hope for. Um, and then in the fall, if you have, uh, you know, a warm, dry March through September where the caterpillar and, you know, students like to lay out on the lawn in September and caterpillar like to eat the trees in September. So if it's nice weather, that happens. The last few days have not been so good for them, which is a, a, is a happy thing for us. Um, Okay, so yeah, cooler, wetter March through June uh, are also mitigating uh, factors. So uh, I guess 
yeah, the thing that I wanted to point out with these two slides is this one, um, these are the factors on this diagram that align with climate change trends in Maine. So when we think about the way the climate is changing in Maine, the parts of this diagram that are being affected are all accelerating factors. Whereas um, these, uh, the factors that are associated with ending the outbreak uh, are contrary to climate trends that we're seeing in the state. So this is a problem that's likely to get worse. Yeah. Um, this is just a diagram showing how uh, the outbreak, this current outbreak started, and then we had a cold, wet spring that shifted it to central Maine. So you can see there it was kind of coastal near Casco Bay, and it shifted uh, north and more centrally uh, to our neighborhood because of uh, climate uh, patterns that happened uh, in 2020. Everything was fun in 2020, wasn't it? Um, okay, so I want to I want to skip over all this and just spend like a minute talking about the municipal response. Um, right, you know, as a city councilor, we're trying to limit the uh, exposure risk in public property. Uh, pres preserve the like $2 million plus valuation of trees on public lands. And, you know, Waterville is trying to make itself a destination. So we, we don't want people to not come to Waterville uh, because we have like a horrible summer. Um, anyways, I talked to city, I put together a, like a comprehensive treatment strategy and I, I'm on the city council. I got the uh, city to, to commit a hundred grand, which was not a simple task. Uh, the budget has been pretty tight uh, for the city, but, um, and came up with a regional strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was the, the initial budget, and I want to draw your attention to this one right here, this 10K uh, that we, we put in there. Actually ended up, we did more contract work with them, but uh, this inventory that we took, that's extremely important. And, and looking forward into the future, we're trying to figure out ways of making this process more efficient, making it less costly uh, for the city, but uh, you know, really uh, maximizing the impact uh, what, by uh, a sort of a data-driven approach that gives us a, a targeted uh, treatment strategy. So I'm going to, yeah, data-driven approach. One of the ways we did that was uh, creating the survey that you could access on the city's website. It was right here. Uh, and that gave us this, I'm gonna skip over a couple of these things. It gave us this uh, big, uh, this really beautiful picture of what the infestation was across the city. Uh, we used these insecticide uh, tree implants uh, to try to kill the critters off, and it worked. So I want to go to the data here. Um, this is the, the citywide uh, tree sampling. This is the full data set uh, as of uh, late <coughs> March. Um, and this took an enormous amount of my time. It, it took a huge amount of my time sorting through this data, uh, QA, QCing it, and trying to figure out what trees needed to be treated how. This is definitely the kind of thing that is algorithmic. It's totally algorithmic. It's easily amenable to uh, yeah, uh, uh, AI approaches. So uh, what else do I want to show here? This is the last slide, that I, the takeaways. So uh, particularly here on campus, we have uh, some real problems because there's these dense clusters of uh, trees that act as reservoirs. Uh, Colby's campus, you see it right, oops, where am I at? Right here, this is Colby's campus. We are surrounded by this huge skirt of trees and there's no dots right in the middle of that because we weren't sampling in there. Uh, but it would be nice to get a sense of how uh, dense that infestation is, right? So we're looking at uh, potentially using drone imaging and then um, and feeding that data into a pipeline that, uh, and that analyzes it and gives us treatment recommendations. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it up there. 